Dr. Scott Metzger and I are going to be talking to you about meaningful discussion of difficult topics, something that's very near and dear to my heart as a teacher and as a doctoral student. Um, so just to do some reintroduction, I'm a doctoral student entering my third year at Penn State, and I'm in curriculum and instruction, and I specialize in social studies education. Um, that's my focus area. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me in Slack um, by direct message or tagging me in a post or through my email address that you'll see there. Um, I will be posting something at the end of the session to share with you a resource. Um, so you can also contact me there. And I'm Dr. Scott Metzger. I'm an associate professor of social studies education uh, here at the University Park campus of Penn State. Um, I've been here for, hmm, I think this is year 15. Uh, before that, I, uh, well, I grew up in Ohio and Michigan, and I taught in the capital area of Michigan for six years uh, before getting my PhD from uh, a certain green and white institution that shall remain nameless. Um, and that brings me to you here today. Uh, again, you're welcome to keep in touch with me uh, after this week, and we'll, we'll be involved in the, uh, in the program throughout the year. Uh, but I've got an easy alias, Metz, M-E-T-Z, at psu.edu, and uh, I'm also on Slack. Thanks, Scott. And Scott's going to start us off talking about difficult topics. Yeah, so I think the best place to begin is sort of definitionally. Um, what makes certain content difficult to learn, to know, by extension to teach? What do we really mean by this phraseology? Uh, it's becoming more commonly used. You'll, I think you're going to increasingly hear it. But it's not exactly brand new. Uh, even the even the nomenclature of difficult knowledge uh, goes back to the late 1990s. But in terms of difficult topics or issues, there are a whole host of closely related labels that have been in existence for many many decades. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that as we as we go on. But let's focus on this difficult part. So we're going to, in today's uh, talk with you, uh, kind of give you a, a, different, a different perspective than may have come up in, in, in some of the previous conversations, where we really want to focus on um, teaching uh, and, and challenges for teaching, strategies for teaching. And this will move things um, into some different different realms. So for example, one way to think about difficult knowledge is complexity. So difficulty can be cognitive difficulty. Sometimes topics are extremely complex. Uh, they might require a tremendous amount of nuance. Or then there are questions of age appropriateness. Um, and the challenge to, to cognitive difficulty is uh, students may just not be at an age developmental point where they can meaningfully understand the nuance or complexity of a, of a topic. And then we face a very serious question of, is a complex, difficult topic half taught um, or half understood? useful or not, or if there's potentially some, some negative consequences that can come out of exposing young learners to only partial information that they can understand and giving the illusion then that they have a more rigorous understanding of something that's very, very complex. Uh, another aspect of difficulty is more in line with what we have uh, been uh, talking about in many other sessions. And uh, the formulation for it that I think is really helpful to contrast with a cognitive difficulty is affective difficulty. Uh, this would then involve emotion, uh, things to be emotionally difficult or uh, psychological difficulty. 
and then that relates to to trauma either through things directly experienced or through traumatic memories that might be passed through family but all of these here then go beyond just oh it makes my brain hurt or i really can't understand the big picture to how it makes me feel how how i react to it um then we have uh, some other things that relate to this and, and, and overlap in some ways. So controversies, issues that are controversial uh, can be difficult to, to learn, to know, to teach. Uh, there's a very long tradition of teaching controversial issues in schools. And what they all share in common is sharp disagreement of values so that different people, different backgrounds, different perspectives will come in with different sets of values and assumptions of what is right, what is most important. Um, and when these are in sharp contrast, this is controversial. Um, how about uh, things that make people uncomfortable for social or psychological reasons? So social or psychologically uncomfortable uh, topics. Uh, these can uh, sometimes be found in just uh, disagreement between sets of values, uh, particularly when we're talking about social issues or conflicts that um, might involve um, uh, identity or the way our identity interfaces with our, our social lives, uh, things that aren't necessarily empirical questions uh, for example, conflicting religious beliefs uh, or morals. Um, when these things are, 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 are put into conflict, they, it can be very psychologically uncomfortable and disturbing. But we also should uh, remember that uh, difficulty can relate to the teacher as well. Um, what happens when teachers aren't comfortable with what they have to teach? And this can include something as very elemental as a lack of knowledge. Uh, one of the hardest things about being a teacher is you could be called upon to teach anything that might relate to your topic. <laughs> Sometimes things you might not thought of as relating to your topic or your, your, your subject area, excuse me. Uh, yet we can't know everything off the top of our heads. So a lack of knowledge of some of these complex, difficult issues or, or perspectives um, can leave teachers feeling uncomfortable. And then several of you at previous times have raised this issue with context. My students, my community, my school, context differs. And so what might be difficult in certain ways in certain contexts might not be true for other contexts where other things might be, might be difficult. Uh, so you may have a school or a classroom with lots of really advanced students for whom cognitive difficulty is less of an issue, uh, but yet you could still have very much the affective or the social or psycho uh, psychological. Melissa, do you want to go to the next slide? Sure. Okay. Um, so building on what Scott, Scott, Scott said, difficult topics is a term that's been along uh, around for a while, um, but it's just gaining some traction within social studies community, um, especially in the academic realm. Um, but this term difficult has also been used in literature down over the years um, as and it's presented differently depending on what grade level or what subject level uh, you're dealing with. So it's also been referred to as sensitive issues Tender topics is used for difficult topics, especially it, um, at the elementary level. Um, difficult knowledge has been used by some researchers in controversial issues. Um, so just knowing um, that these are all referring to the same thing. So what we've done is we've broken to, to give you an idea of what topics tend to be difficult. Um, we've broken them down into three categories historical, political, sociocultural. Now there's considerable overlap as you'll see between the three categories, but here we've given some examples. An example of a historically difficult topic might be genocide um, or slavery. An example of a politically 
difficult topic um, might be refugees or immigration um, or social justice. And sociocultural, an example might be um, censorship or minority rights or identity. So hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of what we're talking about here. So uh, one thing that might be a, a useful clarification is when we look at those example topics, uh, it can often refer to how those things are framed, what aspects of them are being taught about as much as simply the label. Now, in some cases, due to um, the political culture of broader society, sometimes some very labels, names, words can uh, have a flashpoint of difficulty because they're controversial or they will, they will um, feed into partisan splits. In other cases, it's really a matter of e exactly what is difficult about them. So let, let's take let's take we minority rights there because um, the existence of minority rights, the existence of minorities, that's not controversial. That's not what's difficult. I, I suppose in extremist societies, uh, you learned about Myanmar today, uh, where you're you're trying to purge. Uh, uh, minorities from a society, uh, certain groups are, uh, then the existence of minorities is um, controversial or difficult for those societies. But here in, in ours, it's not the existence of minorities or the rights for minorities that is, is what's difficult or controversial. It is the split over what that means. What's the extent? What's the scope? Is it guarantees for what exactly? what constitutes protected minority status. Um, so it, it's really important for us to, to, to not just think about the name or the label, but to think about the substance behind them that would make it difficult. Um, so Melissa, if you wanna go back to the next slide here, um, what about the Holocaust? So the Holocaust is a historical event, it happened. We study all sorts of historical events, ask students to study all sorts of historical events. So what is it about the Holocaust that makes it difficult? Um, after all, there are lots of violent, unpleasant events in the past. There are lots of events where very large numbers of people have died. What is it about the Holocaust in particular then that we would even want to see it as difficult or considered as difficult? We've already touched on some of this in uh, the previous uh, session. So the disturbing details and images, because this happened in very modern history, there is going to be far more left from it. Details, documents, particularly photographs, films, things that don't exist for most of world history where we may have oblique accounts of there was a massacre after this battle and 10,000 were slain. You don't have the details or the images that you would have for the Holocaust. And this raises a whole host of thorny age appropriate and psychological questions then about when is it appropriate, useful and ethical to indulge in the details or to, to show and use some of these images. Trying to parse that is difficult. Now, I just got done saying it happened in modern history, but it's increasingly moving from lived history to beyond lived memory. And that makes it increasingly purely historical. There will be a time in the not too distant future where there will not be anyone left alive who will have directly experienced the Holocaust era of the early to mid 1940s. And at that point, it, it no longer has that lived memory immediacy. And we're already moving into that. And you can then have young people who would look at this and, and say, if, if you think about it, if you're, if you're a 14-year-old child today, you know, the... Uh, I remember we, even when I was young, we, we, we were saying, you know, uh, for, for, for my age, oh, yeah, the, 
you know, the, the early 20th century might as well have been the era of Julius Caesar. It's so long ago and outside the lived memory of children. Thus, it will always uh, be difficult to keep um, uh, connecting that to more immediacy of, of young people's lives. And it, 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 that's a difficult challenge as well, as it's this thing given a lot of weight and evidence, but yet to them, it's going to feel more and more remote, more and more historical. And then the completely opposite side of this is the contemporary political dimensions that the Holocaust has. So it's not just a historical topic because it is invoked and not unfrequently by governments, by advocacy groups in support of things that they want to do. Um, and so that contemporary political dimension, how it is used, uh, will will um, make a uh, uh, will have an effect on on how it's going to be perceived in educational uses in contemporary times. Related to that, then would be sociocultural tensions uh, involving identity. So. We've got all sorts of different perspectives and groups involved in the Holocaust. Um, and uh, we're talking, of course, victims, but also resistors, uh, people who were um, involved or aware to different degrees. So there's questions of collective blame, collective guilt. Um, some, some, we've we talked a little bit about. Uh, how um, it, it can still be a struggle for some young people who learn about the Holocaust to wonder, well, who today are, is there kind of a blood guilt uh, for people today from, from, from Germany or of German ancestry uh, that they've inherited some sort of special obligation because of the Holocaust. There's disputes over how the Holocaust can be used in um, kind of social memory um, for example, in or by Israel or in and by other countries. Um, the result of all this is that Holocaust teaching, direct, sustained, explicit Holocaust teaching, seems to be coming uh, surprisingly infrequent in schools, at least according to recent surveys. Um, and this has been substantiated over time since kind of a, a height of renewed attention to it in the late 1990s, 2000-ish. But particularly in, the, in, in recent years, surveys are suggesting that a lot of schools and classrooms are hesitant to engage in robust teaching about the Holocaust. Um, obviously, uh, this initiative exists to try to do something about that, but encouraging robust, meaningful teaching about the Holocaust as well as other genocides, human rights issues, starts with recognizing this is not easy. This is not waving a wand and saying, okay, you teachers, it, it, you just go do it. Here, we'll give you some tricks and you go do it. We need to acknowledge how and why it's difficult. Melissa, do you wanna to go to the next slide? Uh, here's a useful quote from uh, uh, an article on teaching controversial issues that, that, that might add a little more light. For many educators, the successful teaching of discussion or controversial subjects can be a difficult and sometimes problematic task. The specter of potential parental and community disapproval or blowback is very real, leaving many teachers unwilling to engage in any activities uh, that um, uh, may develop controversy or could engender any opposing views of morals to public scrutiny. Here we're getting back to what I raised as sets of values in conflict. And Lenin's article was published in 2017. I think it has only become truer in the years uh, since. So let's move on to, if these are so difficult, why do we address them? What's, what's the value in this? So we're going to talk about this first um, with the problem with discussion and um, research conducted by Hostetler and Neil uh, found that 
dis discussions are rare um, in classrooms and that quality discussion is simply not happening in most schools or classrooms. And Hostet Lur and Neil conducted a study of 48 social studies classrooms and found no evidence of discussion of relevant social issues in 90% of classrooms. And in the remaining 10% of classrooms, discussions lasted 31 seconds or less among students. So this kind of identifies um, where we are, where we're coming from. Difficult topics is are something that are not typically covered in curriculum. Um, and a lot of teachers kind of tend to shy away from. Um, so this is this is the problem space we're dealing with. So Lumpert um, conducted some research on discussion of difficult topics. And research suggests that avoiding these difficult topics in classrooms does actual lasting harm to students. Um, in a lot of cases, the only place that these conversations are happening in their lives are if a teacher addresses them within the within the confines of a classroom. So as teachers, what is our ultimate why? Why would we willingly engage in conversations that can be uncomfortable for us and for students? And why risk possible classroom disruptions? Engaging students in discussion of difficult topics aids students in developing the important skills of civil discourse, perspective taking, and evaluative thinking. All of these skills, as you see from the Krakow quote, um, are important for democracy and the preservation of democracy. So moving on to the value in teaching and discussion of difficult topics, I've broken it down into skills um, and some other benefits that you get from this. And these are all supported by research. Uh, some of the skills that students can um, build by engaging in discussion of difficult topics are civil discourse, um, as we've seen is necessary for democracy. It can help students draw connections between learning and application. So how it applies to their lives. They can also see relevancy um, by talking about difficult topics, a lot of which, many of which are um, current issues. It can also help students exchange ideas and do so in a respectful manner and expose them to ideas that they may not hear um, on a regular basis. It also helps students understand policy decisions in the background that goes into policy decisions. It also, as I mentioned earlier, um, helps students build respect for perspectives other than their own if they're consistently involved in discussion of difficult topics in the classroom. It also aids in perspective stretching. You'll see a lot of these are similar and there's a bunch of overlap. Um, it, help stretch the perspectives of students and break them out of uh, this is my box <laughs> um, mindset. And it also, which I'll talk about later um, in a second, it also creates some strategic dissonance. Um, so it helps students be exposed to new ideas um, that they then need to reconcile with their own um, previously held beliefs. Some other benefits, it has been shown to increase retention of information if you involve students in classroom discussion. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the classroom can be a safe space for these conversations that research indicates are not happening elsewhere. They're not happening with um, in the community. They're not happening necessarily within student friend groups or at home. Um, so the classroom offers a safe space for that. It also exposes students to different viewpoints other than their own. It has been linked uh, through research to intellectual growth of students and it challenges misconceptions and presentism. Um, now, those of you who may not have encountered the term presentism before, what I'm referring to is seeing the past through today's lens. So a very simple example of that would be why didn't they use this road to get there? 
um, when the road didn't exist at the time. Um, so that's a very simple, it's more complex than that, but that's a very simple explanation. Um, so it combats that and it also combats intolerance um, by listening to different perspectives. So uh, this London quote from 2017, a little bit of discord is not in itself a bad thing as the dissonance between prior disbeliefs, uh, prior beliefs and new learning forces the student to reconcile the two between passion being a common byproduct of the process. St students need to learn how to handle discord and dissonance. Our most common reaction uh, is to, and students most common reaction is to block out ideas, concepts, et cetera, that we aren't familiar with or that are contrary to what we've always thought true. While it's important to not change your opinion every time the wind shifts, it is still important for students to learn how to investigate new information and they will ultimately be the ones who decide whether they're going to take in and add to the worldview. World view. But we as teachers can at least help them consider new information rather than shut it out. So we're going to talk about some wise practices for difficult topics. So in education, we often hear, I'm sure you've heard the term best practices. And while the intent, or I believe the intent behind the term best practices is not all bad, um, it sends the wrong message that there's a one size fits all approach to education. So instead of best practices in this uh, presentation, I will use wise practices. My use of wise practices is meant to signify uh, guiding principles that will likely vary based on your context. So let's start with some research findings about discussion, um, specifically focused on difficult topics. Um, Krakow um, has written about difficult topics um, in 2018 quite extensively, and he made a few observations. Students gravitate towards evidence that support their beliefs, even when provided with teacher curated sources. As a teacher who engaged my students in discussion, and gave them documents um, for debate or for discussion or had them look up things. Um, this came as a little bit of a shock to me, um, but it's important to know. Also, students don't tend to listen to their peers. Um, there's something, something I always talked about with my students was we need to learn how to listen to understand rather than listen to respond. There's a very key difference there. But research shows that students listen to respond. So they're listening to see what they're gonna say next, what they're gonna pick out that's wrong or what they're gonna disagree with. They're not listening to understand the other person's viewpoint. Research also suggests that students decide their position ahead of time. I'm sure we've all experienced this as teachers um, and students tend to participate differently by gender in different contexts. Um, so in some contexts, different um, students with different genders tended to dominate different contexts um, and dominate that discussion. And then teachers tend to micromanage and limit the outcome and meaningfulness of discussions. Can I jump in here with a, a quick illustration of that last point, Melissa? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, so when I was teaching, I was guiltier of, of that um, jumping in. I, you know, I don't know if it was micromanaging so much as, but limiting the outcomes and limiting the meaningfulness of it because every time a student would want to say something, I'd want to respond, right? So I, I've called this the shooting gallery approach, right? It's like, you know, the, the carnival, the, the hand comes up and you shoot the water gun, knock it down. Okay, where's the next one? Ooh, knock it down. Um, I, I just found this a very natural, almost a reflexive approach. And I, I, I imagine many others here may have felt that at times. A lot of this is awareness. For, the first step is awareness of, of what's happening, of what you're doing, even reflexively. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> You're welcome. And it is very difficult. Um, we're even taught as teachers in 
teacher education programs, how to respond to students um, and how to manage it, manage conversations and manage the classroom. Um, so it's a very difficult thing to learn um, to embrace silence and uh, allow the students to have that discussion and take on a facilitating role. So allow me to share some wise practices uh, that are recommended from the research and ones that I have also found true um, to be true when I was teaching in my own teaching context. Boundary setting, uh, sorry, established community. This is the foundational principle to discussion and discussion of difficult topics. You need to, as a teacher, we need to, as teachers, establish a community with our students and a community within our classroom that is safe, that is of a respect, um, and that allows students to freely share their ideas with each other. Establishing that community is the foundation for these discussions and cannot happen without that foundation. That can't happen without those foundations. So involving students in boundary setting. Um, someone mentioned, I'm sorry, I can't see your name because my screen is taking up, but someone mentioned going through uh, a list of respectful discussion practices uh, at the beginning of the school year in the current events class. That's what boundary setting essentially is, but research suggests we should involve students in that. So what are the parameters that your students want to set for classroom discussion? How do you think that um, how do they think that you should respond to certain things that might come up in discussion? What guidelines do they think they should follow? Students surprisingly have quite a bit to say about this. Um, so involving them can actually help you when you are wanting to set up a discussion. Make sure you're choosing topics carefully. So this is just an awareness of your context. Again, you'll hear that word a lot. If there's something that's going to be inflammatory, you need to know that ahead of time. You also need to know your students um, individually and know who may have experienced trauma related to the topic um, or what you think their ideas might be or what they might say. Students will always surprise you with what they say during a discussion, but just making sure you're planning ahead. Third point is build up to classroom discussions. If you think back to your first year of teaching, how disastrous would it have been if you did a group project in the first week at a brand new school and you assigned the groups without knowing the students at all? I did the same thing when I was student teaching and it was enough for me to never <laughs> do it again. The same principle applies here. Unless you have already established a community with all of the students in the class and have already built relationships with them, don't plan to have a classroom discussion in the first week or even first few weeks of a semester or a school year. You need to establish that community and build those relationships before you start to consider discussions in your classroom. Switch it up. Classroom discussion doesn't necessarily mean sitting in a circle. I think that's what most of us tend to think of. Um, so organize, you can organize your class in different ways. It can be small groups. It can be whole class. It can be set up as a structured debate, although keep in mind that debate does do something differently um, and ask students to value different things. It could be set up in different formats if you're doing debate, such as Lincoln Douglas format, if you're familiar with debate formats or parliamentary, or it can be a more spontaneous discussion. A lot of discussions I had with my students were as they came in the door, I dedicated a certain amount of time um, to things that were on their minds. Um, so that can be an example of spontaneous discussion. It depends on your students and your context. And there's that word again, but I can't emphasize it enough. So go beyond pro and con. Give your students something to actually discuss. If something is just pro or con, they're not going to feel like they can engage in discussion and you will automatically get less participation. And then facilitate rather than manage or lead. 
this is one of the hardest things to do as a teacher. Resist the urge to take an active role in the discussion. Hand it over to your students. If you're uncomfortable, designate a student or a couple of students that you know well to guide the conversation and make sure that everyone gets a chance to be heard. Discussion will take time and being comfortable with as a teacher with discussion will take time. It'll also take time for your students to become comfortable with discussion. Um, so don't be discouraged by a less than perfect result the first time. It's a foreign concept for most students. For teachers, it comes with practice. Knowing your students and being intentional about the classroom community that you are setting up at the beginning of each school year or semester. So this quote from Krakow um, reminds us what the role of teacher as a facilitator looks like. So as of when I'm saying facilitate, this is what I'm meaning. Being ready and willing to intervene in classroom deliberations, not expressing your own opinions, but to remind students to follow their own rules of discussion, help them diffuse questions, call attention to factual misunderstandings, and especially to make sure that competing perspectives are offered and heard. So you're taking a role of a facilitator rather than a leader. And oftentimes, physically, what that looks like in the classroom is stepping to the perimeter of the class and not involving yourself um, and not hovering, as we tend to do sometimes as teachers. <laughs> Again, if this is uncomfortable for you now, um, or if this gives you a little bit of anxiety now as you're thinking about it, don't give up. It comes with time. And then Scott's going to talk about some wise practices for teaching and discussing of difficult topics. Yeah, so let's kind of take this general background here on facilitating productive. I like that phrase Jen brought up, you know, facilitating productive classroom talk and think then about, well, what does this mean if we're trying to do this with the difficult topics? So wise practices here, some of this might strike you as, as, as common sense. Um, Many of you may have heard many of these before, but I think it's still helpful to let's bring all this out into the open into, into our professional awareness. Um, so this first, this first wise practice is just sort of good for almost anything you might do in the classroom, but it becomes really essential when you're dealing with these difficult topics. Know your students and community contexts. These contexts will affect the kind, the ways in which they may find the topics difficult. It will affect the kinds of framing, labeling, word choices that may be accepted or might spark pushback. You'll get a sense for what uh, the community, uh, sort of the, the boundaries of, of community norms that may uh, again, they encourage buy-in or, or pushback. Know these when you're making these uh, uh, decisions. And the decisions then would be in preparation. Uh, going into these discussions, um, perhaps more than any other kind of classroom talk, it needs, you need to be prepared with information, with structure, and I'm also going to suggest it's helpful to have an idea of the kinds of responses that one, you think you could get, but also the kinds of responses you hope to get. By being prepared with information, you will be able to step in when necessary to correct, how shall we say, facile claims <laughs> uh, and to, to shift the conversation into more uh, academically defensible positions as necessary. The structure will, and this again, when I say structure, this is everything from how your classroom is arranged to uh, the, the amount of time that you are dedicating to each of the steps to how you're asking students to uh, engage in the discussion. Are you starting with think, pair, share? Is it small group, then to whole group, whole group? Um, these can be decided on the fly, but a wise practice is to prepare this in advance based on your knowledge of your students, your classroom, your context. As for those responses, um, perhaps the thing here that uh, we've not all stopped to consider before is not just, 
oh, I'm afraid students might respond this way, or I'm pretty sure those students will respond that way, but also your goals. What kinds of responses would you hope to get put out there? This is not indoctrination. Forcing, guiding, pushing everybody to echo the same response would be indoctrination. But having responses that you hope students will learn to be able to consider that will be put out into the mix and being ready to put them into the mix yourself if the students aren't, that is, is, is very um, wise preparation. Of course, the teacher, even if you are playing a facilitating role with uh, difficult uh, topics, it's still, it's still uh, actively involved mentally, intellectually, because there's a, a huge uh, role for teacher questions. When students are saying things, teachers should not hesitate to, well, okay, so you said X, Y, Z. How do we know X, Y, Z? And you don't have to make it adversarial. You could say, I'll open this up to anybody. So anybody who, who might have heard this claim, how do we know that? Um, or if the students start to position something in a way that's, that's uh, irresponsible or that is um, very extreme, you can ask questions that will move it back toward responsible framing. Well, do you really think the people that you're criticizing actually are claiming that? Or are you assuming that that's what they mean when they say this other thing? You know, let's really, let's kind of look at an example of what, 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 do, what do those other people, that group actually say themselves? Um, and then questioning can facilitate deeper thinking or even student talk. You know, hey, Johnny, I just heard you say X, Y, Z. A few minutes ago, Janie said ABC. Um, what do you think about how what you just said might connect to what Janie just said? Huge role for teacher questioning. Um, we've already talked about classroom community. If it's, a, if, it's, if it's wise for any kind of discussion, it is even more essential here for the difficult topics because this is what will build a, a, a key foundation of listening to understand versus hearing to respond slash interject. I'm not just I'm not just sitting there watching somebody's mouth flap so that I can wait until they take a breath so that I can jump in and say, but you're wrong because I know XYZ. That is a very different model as opposed to listening to understand, which is I'm hearing something that I don't agree with. But if I listen to understand, I will at the least better understand why anybody else could believe that. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to like it, but I can understand that difference better by listening. And that kind of listening is a, is a bedrock foundation for civil discourse that we are not seeing. Um, very much in our society or our public culture in recent years. Um, being ready to deal with students who are hesitant to talk. Um, and I think, Katie, when you brought up bullying um, or blowback after the class, outside of the classroom, there could be a lot of worry, um, particularly when there are some people in the school, in the classroom, who are extremely passionate about a particular perspective. You can then have students who disagree with it, but simply might be less passionate in their disagreement, or they might feel that they're in a minority of the disagreement. And so they may worry about saying anything. Being ready to help bridge that hesitancy is a wise practice. I think in some ways this involves getting comfortable with silence. We've all heard about the seven second wait time, I hope, right? Uh, boy, I really, had to, I really had to train myself in the seven seconds wait time. But when we're dealing with difficult topics, I think we need to get comfortable with silence. It may take time for people who are hesitant to talk to be willing to talk, to formulate their words. They might need a process. You might say, let's take 60 seconds to cool down and sit in silence. In the 60 seconds, think to yourself, is there something you could add to this? Especially those of you who haven't talked yet. 
Is there something you could add in a way that, you know, we're not trying to raise the temperature again, but let's take the 60 seconds to, to cool down and think. Yeah, that's silence as process. Uh, and I would say the going beyond the pro and con opposing viewpoints. Um, the problem with pro and con when it comes to difficult topics, I mean, it's a very common thing for controversial issues when it's public policy. Should taxes be raised or lowered? Should this be set or changed? Um, that pro con has been around for a long time. The more difficult the topic, pro con boils down complexity into two almost armed camps. It's really important to get beyond this notion of this versus that if we want to really meaningfully understand difficult topics. Um, and of course, this relates to inquiry. We're investigating. This is not necessarily about forcing people to agree with you or change the way other people think. It is inquiry into understanding why perspectives differ. That's a kind of critical thinking. Here's a little phrase that comes out of the social studies research, multi-perspectivity. Getting beyond just these two camps to understand multiple experiences and perspectives and using them to investigate nuance and complexity. But related to this is we as teachers, as educators, as presenters here this week, we're not somehow immune to our own beliefs and values. We're influenced by them as well. Trying to deny that or trying to cut that off may very well be a, um, an impossibility. However, we really should be aware of how our beliefs and values influence us so that at times when we need to be dispassionate, more even-handed, we'll be aware of when that's likely to happen. Melissa, do you want to? Uh... So um, a, a, a complication here about difficult topics is even getting agreement <laughs> when something is difficult. So if an issue is open, and here I think I'm really talking more about kind of the controversial issues here, you know, if they're open, it's, it's easier to position this as, okay, we need to have a, a civil discourse. Uh, open issues are those that are matters of live controversy, current government policy, you know, the election season, um, you know, uh, uh, voting rights versus uh, you know, uh, vote, vote security. Um, these are open live issues. But then there are these things that are called settled issues, right? These are questions for which there's already broad based agreement that a particular decision is well warranted. The challenge is people who are very passionate about a particular side of an issue want it to be settled. No, there is no longer a reason to discuss it. It's already settled. But that can change. And people might push back against that and say, no, no, it's still open. I don't agree with that. And so there is a power dynamic in what issues are classified as open and what are classified as settled that it's really important for teachers to be aware of so that if people are pushing back, how can we even discuss this? This isn't a matter of controversy. This is already settled. Be prepared to frame it in a way then that will point to, well, here's why in some ways for some people in some aspects, it's still open. It's still a viable topic for disagreement and discussion. Yeah, Thank you. I'll also add to that, the, the research does suggest that teachers should stay away from posing settled issues as open issues. So just acknowledging what is settled and what is open. So just yeah. building on what Scott said. Yeah. So for example, did the Holocaust happen <laughs> would be a very poor example of trying to take something that is factually settled and pitch it as an open issue. Are there some extremists that would like to do that? Yes. Might some of those students be in your class? Yeah. Nonetheless, we still need to find a way to turn that into something that, that will keep them included in the class and willing to learn. But yeah, it's very important not to masquerade one as the other. So let's talk about some wise practices for discussion. And again, 
discussion, difficult topics, they tend to bleed together, but they are, there are two different areas of research. Uh, so let's talk about these. So first up is discussion versus recitation. Now Larson um, published in 1999, talking about the tension between discussion and recitation and found that uh, many teachers believe that they're engaging in discussion when they're actually engaging in recitation with their students. It's an older article, but it's been supported by newer ones as well. And I think it's important to highlight here True discussion requires the teacher to relinquish some control of the classroom and assume the role of facilitator. Meaningful and respectful discussion supports students' democratic citizenship. Recitation, on the other hand, is often mistaken for discussion. Like lecture, recitation is teacher-dominated classroom interaction. Recitation limits students' thinking and ensures that it stays within predetermined boundaries. If you find yourself at the front of the classroom or standing really close to a group that is meant to be having a discussion and firing questions and expecting quick answers, you are engaging in recitation. You're not engaging the students in discussion. So it's a key um, thing to recognize as a teacher when you are doing each. One of the roles in discussion is, uh, important roles of the teacher in discussion is questioning. So questioning and being able to ask questions that are meaningful in discussion begins with building a classroom culture um, and setting those norms within your classroom. And it starts from the very first day that your students hit the door. One of the ways, um, and it's kind of a silly way, admittedly, but it gets students interested. One of the ways that I socialize students to a classroom that, um, in my classroom, that they would be having discussions in frequently was within the first day, I had them do a silly exercise as a class where we talked about um, their viewpoints on certain things like Bigfoot or <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster. They're comfortable things for the students to talk about um, and it gets, it's a low stakes way of socializing them to discussion. And it helps you also begin to learn um, about your students' personalities. May or may not work in your context, but it worked, worked for me and my students. Um, so again, I'll echo what Scott mentioned before, preparation is key. So preparing um, in order to be able to ask the right questions and ask the guiding questions and to be able to redirect. If you don't know what you're discussing as a class, then you're not going to be able to help your students. So making sure that you are well prepared um, and you don't have to be an expert on the issue, but just making sure that you've read multiple perspectives and that you're brushing up on information if it's something that you haven't touched on in a while or read about yourself in a while. So just making sure that you know about it. Neutrality of questions. So research has found that neutrality is crucial for truly reflective and critical dialogue to take place within the classroom. So making sure, I've always called it devil's advocate in my classroom. Um, so making sure that you are encouraging the multi-purpose perspectivity um, in your classrooms. And then also question for critical thinking and deeper understanding. Um, one method of this and one well understood method of this is Socratic questioning. So you're answering not with answers, you're answering with questions to prod um, and probe for deeper, deeper thinking and more critical thinking from your students. And there are wonderful guides to types of Socratic questions and how to do Socratic questioning within your classroom um, is something that I used. If you're interested in those guides that I found um, just through research and as a teacher, um, just perusing the internet, feel free to reach out to me on Slack. I'm happy to share them with you. You can also use here the guides for um, revised blooms. So hitting those higher order questions um, and hitting a range of questions that are in the higher tiers. So Willen in 2004 um, published an article about misconceptions 
of dis about discussion and then endorse principles based on those misconceptions. I'm going to share those five here with you. Um, so, so you can see. So misconception number one is that a discussion consists of the teacher asking questions and students answering them. We now know, um, or hopefully we now know that that is actually recitation. So the endorsed principle from the research is that a discussion is a conversation between students or dialogue, as was mentioned before, um, between teachers and students and includes both answering questions and making statements for both the teacher and the students. Misconception number two is that teachers give students enough time during discussions to re reflect, formulate, response, and express them. Scott um, talked about the seven second wait time. When you are doing discussion, particularly discussion of difficult topics, students need more than that. They need time to process. Think about how much time you need to process things or even just process the sessions that you're involved in right now. Students need adequate time for reflection and teachers need to provide that wait time throughout discussion so that the students can catch up with their thoughts and process everything that they've heard in order to be able to respond. Not giving them that time reinforces the need for students to respond without understanding. Um, so it reinforces that type of environment. So you wanna make sure and provide that. Misconception number three, Teachers cannot get students involved in discussions if the students do not, do not want to participate. As I've um, talked about discussion and I've talked with my colleagues when I was teaching in a K-12 context about discussion, this is what I heard most of the time. And even before I started delving into discussion with my students, I held this misconception as well. There are ways, and I'm sure we can all be creative, um, that we can entice our students to participate by using a variety of techniques, varying our structures. Um, the research actually recommends effective questioning, um, Socratic questioning, and the combined use of recitation and discussion. Wait time is also very important. Something happens in classrooms. From my own experience, something happens when you tell students, I have five minutes and I'm not going to say anything in that five minutes. So it's up to you to keep this discussion going forward. Um, so you can prompt students to talk. Misconception number four is teachers are unbiased when encouraging students to make discussion contributions. And the endorsed principle here, um, I thought that Willen's quote actually covered it very well. So I didn't try to Paraphrase, uh, but teachers need to demonstrate equity in encouraging discussion by not differentiating students in terms of the discussion structures used, types of questions asked, response opportunities provided, and general quantity and quality of classroom interaction. So as a teacher, what this means is just keeping an eye to how you are interacting with students and keeping an eye to equity um, and how you are encouraging discussion. Uh, with your students, each and every one of them individually. Misconception number five, and the last one, is teachers cannot objectively evaluate students' contributions during classroom discussions. So this also was a misconception that I heard quite frequently when talking with my colleagues. And as I've talked about discussion um, over the past couple of years, the endorsed principle, um, on the other side of that is that rubrics can actually be quite useful and they can be used to accept, uh, assess discussion and um, should be used to assess what is valued from the discussion. So this takes some reflection as the teacher. Um, what do you want students to take from this discussion? Do you want them try, to try and be right? Do you want them to win? Um, what do you want them? What's your goal for the discussion? And building that into the rubric. Also, sharing the rubric with your students prior to, to discussion. In my classroom, I had a base rubric for discussions of 
that I worked on with my students of base principles of what a discussion should be and what it should include. But then for specific conversations that I had planned um, that weren't spontaneous, I had specific rubrics um, that could expand on that base rubric when necessary. And Scott's going to talk with you about some practical tools. Yeah. We're, we're down to our final uh, minutes here. So I do want to I do want to save time at the end for people to raise thoughts, um, ask questions. Uh, I know Linda Schwab had, had uh, her hand up and I definitely want to give Linda a chance to, to speak here. So we've got the last two slides that I think since we're going to make a copy of this available to everyone, um, we, we can largely leave these last two uh, approaches. These, these are very practical systems you could use uh, for you to look at. I'll just point out here, slide 31 is an approach to the alternate framing of difficult issues. I talked about multi-perspectivity. So this is a structure that you could use with students to engage in alternate framing as a basis for discussion. You identify what are different perspectives avoid the inflammatory labeling? Can we find any mutually shared labeling that would allow us to say, this is the issue at stake and these are the stakeholders? And then this approach basically tries to investigate and lay out what is a generalization on the issue that would be advanced from each perspective? And then what's a strong critique of each perspective's generalization from the other perspectives? And then how might each perspective respond to that critique? And this would then be done for each of the perspectives on the issue, at least two. But ideally, you would explore three or even four perspectives on a difficult issue. I'll point out a few, a few things here at, at, the, at the bottom, a caution. We have to handle partisan media with care. Um, uh, right now, we seem to be in a cultural moment where virtually all media is partisan in some way and intensely partisan. Um, I would just say we have to handle that with care. Um, if you have two different media sources and one's extreme in one direction and the other is extreme in the other direction, I don't know if those two extremities cancel each other out. Be very, very cautious. The other thing I'll stress again, not all topics have responsible alternate, alternate frames. It really depends on what the inquiry is. Did the Holocaust happen? Does not have responsible alternate frames. Yet a question like, why are there still some groups in countries around the world that want to insist the Holocaust didn't happen? That is a question that could be investigated but not did the Holocaust happen? There aren't alternate frames on that. And then Melissa, you've got uh, 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 your model here to share. Yep. So I will be um, either directly after this presentation or sometime this afternoon, be sharing a, um, a guide that I built um, for thinking through difficult topics before you engage them, um, engage with them in your classroom and includes an adapted FRAIR model. Um, so if you're not familiar with a FRAIR model, it's usually used for vocabulary that's new to students, but I've adapted it for this. Um, but basically, it, the worksheet um, or guide is to help you ask some of the questions and help you get into the practice of preparing for these difficult topics. 